This program is intended for women who are considering a prenatal screening test for Down syndrome, neural tube defects, and trisomy 18. This video is not intended for women who, in their current pregnancy, have already had prenatal screening for Down syndrome, neural tube defects, and trisomy 18, have already had chorionic villus sampling, or amniocentesis, or are past 22 weeks of pregnancy. I felt that prenatal screening was kind of a routine thing to do and that everybody did it and it was that time in my pregnancy that you know I had the blood test and I didn't really realize the implications of it. I chose to have prenatal screening because I was scared and I wanted confirmation that everything was okay. I needed to know in advance um, so I needed to have the prenatal screening for my own peace of mind. A lot of people who have the prenatal testing go into it thinking everything's going to be okay, and then they have a decision to make when it isn't. Hello, I'm Rebecca Pashir, your host for this program. Congratulations on your pregnancy. Most babies are born healthy, but about three in every 100 babies are born with a birth defect. While no test can identify all birth defects, Prenatal screening tests can help us determine which babies have a higher chance of having certain types. The purpose of this video is to help you decide whether or not to have prenatal screening for Down syndrome, neural tube defects, and trisomy 18. Screening only tells you if your baby may have one of these conditions. Further tests would be needed to tell you for sure. In this program, you will learn about Down syndrome, neural tube defects, and trisomy 18 from doctors who care for children with these conditions. We'll explain how prenatal screening is done and the information it will give you. Then, women and couples will share their stories and the decisions they made. We'll leave you with some important questions to ask yourself when deciding whether or not to have prenatal screening. You have a choice about whether or not to have prenatal screening, and the right choice depends on what matters most to you. Carl Cooley was a primary care pediatrician for many years, but after his daughter Sarah was born with Down syndrome, he specialized in developmental pediatrics focusing on children with disabilities and following over 200 children with Down syndrome. The primary cause of Down syndrome is really unknown. It results from a, a genetic alteration in which the individual has um, an extra 21st chromosome. So that where most of us have 46 chromosomes, the individual with Down syndrome has uh, a 47th chromosome. And that sort of overdose of the products of that chromosome cause the, the various characteristics of Down syndrome, physical characteristics, medical characteristics, and developmental differences. Down syndrome occurs in about one in 800 newborns. Anyone can have a baby with Down syndrome, but the chances increase as a woman gets older. Children with Down syndrome are at risk for a number of medical conditions which occur more frequently in them than in other individuals. The most uh, serious, probably, is, is a congenital heart defect to be born with uh, holes between chambers of the heart or something that would require repair in order to uh, remain healthy. In addition, um, there may be obstructions of the intestinal tract that require attention right away in order for the baby to be able to, um, to feed normally. Um, those are not usually terribly complicated but require a surgical procedure to fix. Most of the medical conditions are um, manageable, treatable, controllable to the point that they're not impacting health at all. The things they do are going to happen later. They're going to walk at a later age. They're going to talk at a later age. In most respects, these developmental events are going to occur. And um, it's kind of like a book in which the pages are turning a little more slowly. 
Oliver is a seven-year-old boy who has Down syndrome. He's learning language very slowly, and, but that's the spoken language because he can, he can tell you exactly what he is feeling about something, a positive, negative. He guides you to what he wants. Liam is also seven years old. He's so smart. It's not about him not being smart. It's about the rest of the world learning how to teach him because he learns differently. I expect that most children with Down syndrome will learn to read, learn to be able to read for pleasure, uh, will be able to participate in regular classroom settings with the support of an aide or an assistant, uh, be able to develop friendships, participate in community sports activities. And communities in turn are anticipating the participation of these kids so that Growing up, the lives of children with Down syndrome bear more similarities to their brothers and sisters than differences, I think. You know, there are all sorts of myths out there about children with Down syndrome. Um, one is that they're always happy. Totally not true. Hmm. Liam is not always happy. He's a seven-year-old boy who has feelings and behaviors just like any other child, but um, he sees the world in a different way. The two of them get along pretty well together when Oliver's not Simon. needling Simon. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, it's wonderful being their parents. We're very lucky. Artis Olson is a pediatrician who has been caring for children with neural tube defects for over 20 years. She is the medical director of Dartmouth-Hitchcock's Spina Bifida Clinic. The term spina bifida literally means split spine, and in fact it's an easy name to say, although the more medically technical term is spinal dysraphism, meaning something wrong with how your spine forms. Um, and so it covers a range of disorders that all happen when the spine is closing up when the baby has not yet been born. And they range from profound disorders where the entire brain has been affected in how it forms, called anencephaly to the most common form called spina bifida. Those babies are born with an open part of the spine or a very delicate thin sac over the spinal membrane and tissues. And that needs to be repaired shortly after birth. And the nerves that have gotten captured into that sac often are the same nerves that don't work below that level. Neural tube defects, including anencephaly and spina bifida, are found in about one in every 1,500 pregnancies. They are not associated with the mother's age, but are due to a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Babies with anencephaly do not survive. Most die within the first few days of life. Spina bifida can lead to a range of disabilities, such as problems with walking and bladder and bowel control. Children with spina bifida often develop hydrocephalus, which is commonly called water on the brain a shunt may be surgically placed to drain the extra fluid from the brain. Jacob is a seven-year-old boy who was born with spina bifida. Day one he had the surgery to repair his spine and then um, at day seven he had his shunt placed to remove the fluid off his brain. Jacob now is able to walk with KFOs which are long leg braces and arm crutches and he uses his wheelchair when he gets tired, which is completely fine with us. Um, he crawls around the house when he gets tired of all the extra equipment, and um, he's just a very bright, energetic little boy. Children in this condition can do very well. There's a whole range of intelligence, just like anyone else. Um, learning disabilities are more common, but we diagnose them early and help kids appropriately. It's important to realize that Families who raise a child with spina bifida are going to face medical and developmental challenges that other families with a normal child will not face. They will be involved in an ongoing process where specialists monitor their child's care and varying surgical procedures will be offered over time to help ameliorate or prevent difficulties. He has days where he gets sad and we have to have discussions and other days where he doesn't even realize he has a disability, so it depends on the day. He doesn't look at it as a disability. He looks at it as an accomplishment. He can 
um, do anything anybody else can do. It just may take them a little bit longer or um, may have to work a little harder. John Carey has been caring for children with trisomy 18 and related conditions for over 30 years. He was a key figure in creating a family support organization for these conditions. Like Down syndrome, trisomy 18 is the result of an extra chromosome. While the cause for this is unknown, the chance of having a baby with trisomy 18 increases with the age of the mother. Trisomy 18 syndrome occurs in about one in 6,000 live-born infants. Since almost half of all babies with trisomy 18 are stillborn, the actual frequency among total births approaches one in three to 4,000. The individual baby doesn't look very different than another infant, and in fact, looks very petite. So parents are frequently surprised how serious the condition is just based on the external findings of the baby. Typically, babies with trisomy 18 are small. They often have birth defects, which are usually seen by ultrasound during the pregnancy. Most children with trisomy 18 don't live beyond six months. There have been around 10 population studies done in different parts of the world that show that about 50% of babies have died by a week or seven days of age and about 80% of infants have died by six months of age. By a year of age, only about five to 10% of children are still alive. Children with trisomy 18 usually have, a, have enough of a motor disability that they're not able to walk unassisted, and children are not able to speak, but they do understand and comprehend much more than they can say. Overall, when studies have been performed, of developmental skills of older children, five to 10 years of age. Again, usually the skills are somewhere before the 12 month level. Given the seriousness of the medical problems with trisomy 18, especially the fact that many children die in the first few hours or weeks of life, it's very common and natural for parents to ask the question, perhaps it might be in her best interest to discontinue or terminate the pregnancy. It's, it's my opinion that I would support parents in any decision they would make. That is the decision to stop the pregnancy if that's the decision both parents come to on their own or the decision to continue the pregnancy and do the best one can do at the time of birth. Libby's parents found out that she had trisomy 18 before she was born. With this information, I was able to educate myself based on other people's personal experiences mm -hmm. w and, and plan. I'm not sure you can ever prepare because you really don't know what you're going to feel until the situation unfolds, but plan for the different scenarios for what the trisomy 18 diagnosis brings. One of the biggest benefits, I think, from finding out um, for the actual delivery was we knew what the outcomes were and we could sort of put a plan in place for what they could be. I mean, there was demise before birth, demise during birth, living a little while, and, you know, we were hoping for the living a little while, you know. The first breath, the first cry, I was like, the rest is just a bonus. Prenatal screening tests can tell you what the chances are that your baby has Down syndrome, a neural tube defect, or trisomy 18. These tests involve measuring certain pregnancy-related proteins in your blood. Many screening tests also use information from an ultrasound. Results are reported as either screen positive or screen negative. A positive screen means a high risk for the baby to have one of these conditions. A negative screen means a low risk. Most results are true negatives meaning that the screening test indicates a low risk and the baby does not have Down syndrome, a neural tube defect, or trisomy 18. 
However, it's possible that you can have a false positive result, meaning the screening test indicates a high risk when the baby does not have the condition. Or you can have a false negative result where the screening test indicates a low risk when in fact the baby does have the condition. Most labs will report a specific risk. For example, a 1 in 10 risk means that out of every 10 women who have this result, one will have a child with the condition, while the other nine will not. In the same way, a 1 in 100 risk means that out of 100 women who have this result, one will have a child with the condition, while the other 99 will not. Women who have a screen positive result will be offered a diagnostic test. Diagnostic testing is different from screening. A diagnostic test can tell you for sure whether or not your baby has Down syndrome, a neural tube defect, or trisomy 18. The common diagnostic tests are amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling. An amniocentesis is done by inserting a needle through the mother's belly and into the uterus to collect a sample of amniotic fluid. Chorionic villus sampling is done by collecting a small piece of placental tissue, either by inserting a needle through the mother's belly or by inserting a thin tube through the vagina and into the uterus. Both of these tests are done under ultrasound guidance. However, because they are invasive tests, there is a chance they could cause a miscarriage. The risk for miscarriage is about 3 to 10 out of every 1,000 procedures. Remember, most screening results are true negatives, but if you have a screen positive result, you will need to decide whether or not to have a diagnostic test, which can give you a definite answer, but has a risk of miscarriage. Clarissa and Nicholas had a prenatal screening test that showed a high chance for their baby to have Down syndrome. They chose to have an amniocentesis to find out for sure. There were actually a one in seven chance that yeah. Ainsley was going to be born in with Down syndrome. Which I thought was really high. I really didn't know what to think. I mean, I thought one in seven chance, wow, I mean, and this is this could really, you know, be what's happening. And I said, well, what do we do now? We were given the option of going to Dartmouth-Hitchcock and having uh, an ultrasound done, like a high-definition ultrasound. And then you could follow that up with amniocentesis. Well, we knew that uh, there was a 1 in 300 chance that you could have a miscarriage um, brought on by the amniocentesis. I guess we wanted to go through the whole procedure. Right, we wanted you know. to know. Know for sure. We wanted to know just so that we could prepare ourselves for, you know, what lies ahead with our child. <laughs> we got those results and that was pretty much conclusive that she did not have Down syndrome, big sigh right. of relief right. for both of us. And right. Clarissa's amniocentesis result was normal, meaning that her screening result was a false positive. Cassandra, on the other hand, had a screening test that showed an increased risk for her baby to have a neural tube defect. An ultrasound showed that the baby had spina bifida. I had the AFP test at around 16 to 18 weeks and um, I got a phone call while I was at work to tell me that the um, number was elevated and that the next step would be a level 2 ultrasound, at which point they confirmed the spina bifida and I, they then offered me an amnio to do further genetic testing. I declined the amnio um, because for me the benefits didn't outweigh the risks and um, we had pretty definitive answers with the ultrasound and I felt comfortable with that. You do the why me and um, then you try to beg, barter and plead <laughs> and then one day you wake up and you decide that you need to push forward. Um, I decided that this pregnancy was going to go forth and I needed to be there for this child. I think it's important to have the entire medical team per well prepared for delivery and also yourself to be strong for when the baby comes and be there in mind and spirit for that child and not be doing the why me at that point. 
Christy and Dan also found out from an ultrasound that their baby had spina bifida. They chose to have an amniocentesis to learn more. I didn't choose to have the prenatal screening, although I was offered it because I was considered advanced maternal age, but we discussed it and we didn't have screening with our other children and, and knew that at that point the outcome would be the same with or without the screening. The ultrasound was to find out if it was a boy or a girl and, you know, that all the parts were growing properly and, right. you know, we figured we Normal would get procedure. all the information that we would need to proceed with the way we were going to from the ultrasound. She, you know, explained to us the spina bifida situation and then she said at times, rarely, they see spina bifida with the trisomy 18 right. and that the only test to prove that would have, would have been the amniocentesis. So at that point, we needed to know what we were dealing with fully. When we got the result, results of the amniocentesis, we found out that the baby had trisomy 18. Probably for this experience, I would have told you that I was dead set against like amniocentesis because there is a risk of um, Oh, sure. Yeah, there was a risk with the amnio as well. And, too. Yeah, but I, I do feel that without that, this would have just been a bad, bad situation. Bad situation gone worse. Yeah, the so. worst of a bad situation. Instead, we got the best of a bad situation. <laughs> if I had to do it all over again, well, we knew what the outcome was going to be. Let's start asking those questions now. What could we do? Can you, in fact, enjoy the time that you have? Of course you can. It's all in what you make it. Yeah. Unlike Christy, Barbara was very concerned about her age-related risk. She chose to forgo screening and go directly to an amniocentesis. The phone rang and it was the doctor and he asked if it would be okay to tell me the results of the amniocentesis on the phone. He told us that I don't know all the technical words that he used but something about the chromosomes but basically telling us that the baby was going to be a child that had Down syndrome. We went to go see the genetic counselor, um, my husband and myself and my aunt came with us at the time. Um, she told us different options. She, um, I think she helped us weigh, you know, what we thought would be best for us, um, the pros and the cons, you know, of having a child that has Down syndrome. That evening, we discussed it at great length because we had to make a decision. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of time in between, and we knew that. And I think after talking, and we did a lot of crying before and after, but I think mostly talking, uh, talking it out, we, did, we both decided that it just wasn't the right thing for us to do, that we would need to um, terminate the pregnancy. I think looking back at the decision, um, I know that neither one of us regret the decision we made because it was the right thing for us. Um, I will always wonder the what ifs will always be there and I don't think a day goes by where neither one of us stop thinking about him. Um, but I don't believe it was the wrong thing to do. I still truly believe that for us it was the right decision that we did make. Like Barbara, Susan and Mike found out during their pregnancy that their baby had Down syndrome. They had declined screening, but when Susan's ultrasound raised the possibility of Down syndrome, they chose to have an amniocentesis. The one thing we did want was the ultrasound because we wanted to see the baby and we wanted to see, we were dying to know the sex of the, our first child too, so. It, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I don't, I, I remember not thinking of it as a prenatal test, it's more of an opportunity a, to yeah, see our baby. Yeah. <laughs> and the radiologist comes in and says, there are three markers here. I don't even remember what they were. It was not an easy decision to have the amnio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was not a, an easy decision for us at all to have that. And, and it, it um, I, I still feel somewhat a little twinge of guilt yeah. about it because I think we mm -hmm. could have risked losing Oliver. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm happy we had it done, very happy, because um, we did find out he had Down syndrome. And when you find the news that you have a child who is going to have a disability that is going to be with him or her for 
lifetime, it's shattering news. And so we took the time to grieve during my pregnancy, not when the baby was, was with us. And that was extremely important for us to get over that loss. We had gone through the process on our own, mm -hmm. and then we made it okay for other people to come to us and celebrate our pregnancy and mm -hmm. the upcoming birth of our baby. Joanne's son was also born with Down syndrome. She learned of this after his birth, as she had chosen not to have any testing during her pregnancy. After some time and much consideration, she and her husband arranged for their son to be adopted by another family. The doctor came in holding him and started to tell us about the Down syndrome. And, and at the time, he just said they suspected it was Down syndrome. It was totally heartbreaking. Um, I think one of the first things we did when we found out was we looked at each other and said, haven't we had enough? Because we each were raised with siblings with disabilities. We talked some more with uh, one of the counselors in the hospital, I think the social worker, who said that there were families that would adopt children with Down syndrome. The first thought that went through my mind was, oh my gosh, I'd have to leave town. I could never live here again if we did that. We took Brian home with us for a few weeks. We tried to see if we could do it. We met with a lot of other birth parents of children, met their children. We were put into situations where we were supposed to feel better, that we'd see these children with Down syndrome and think, oh, it's not as bad as we think it is. I never felt better. I always felt like it was exactly what I expected it would be. And I guess they were trying to prove to us that it wasn't like it used to be, which it isn't. Ch children are going through schools. They're, they're having quote unquote normal lives. But for us, it was still devastating. But then when we found this family, it was almost like it was meant to be. I think if I'd had the prenatal testing and was looking at adoption, we would have had our plans made ahead of time instead of trying to take care of a newborn, take care of a two and a half year old, have all the trauma of giving birth and taking care of everything at the same time and looking for an adoptive family. It's good to plan ahead of time. Sarah and Michael also found out that their son had Down syndrome after he was born. This news was unexpected because Sarah's screening results had shown a low chance for their baby to have Down syndrome. This means that her screening results had been a false negative. I went to my doctors after I had the, alpha, the blood screening test that came back off the charts perfect. Um, you know, I think I was like one in an incredibly high number to have a child with Down syndrome. So according to that test alone, there was no need to do an amnio. The chances of me having a baby with Down syndrome were far less than the risks from actually having the amnio. The minute he came out, the doctor lifted him up and I said, is he perfect? And she said, Sarah, he is absolutely perfect. And I just cried. I was so happy. And that was it. Like I knew he didn't have Down syndrome and everything was perfect. So they took Liam and I went to the recovery room and about 10 minutes later, I was relaxed and happy and in walks my OB with my husband and the chief pediatrician. And they looked at me and I could just tell if something was wrong because Michael looked like a ghost. And they said, we think your baby has Down syndrome. I was overcome with feelings of anger and sadness and shock and despair and hopelessness and just this incredible just devastation. I was, I was obviously stunned, but uh, I think inside myself I just felt like I, I knew Sarah was going to be upset. And, um, and I just, I just uh, right off the bat, decided I had to be strong so that I could help Sarah. I didn't want to have anything to do with the baby, to be honest. And like, Liam was in, I was think in at that NICU. point, he was in the NICU, so he couldn't be in the room. He couldn't come in with us, so... You know, she would have to go to excuses, him. Right. And then my doctor, who I credit, I credit her with a lot. She came in and 
she sat down right next to me and she, she <laughs> said, get off your butt and get in there and go see him. And I, something just clicked in me. It, it's hard to even talk about it because I get really emotional. But something just clicked. And I said, oh my gosh, she's right. You know, like, he needs me. I'm his mom. He doesn't have another mom. Let's go figure this out. So I walked down to the NICU. From that moment on, I did not leave his side. It just took, I just had to see him. And I, I'll never forget it. I walked into the NICU, and he was laying in an isolate. And he was the most beautiful baby I've ever seen in my life. I never had another test for either of my other two pregnancies. Because I knew I could handle whatever God gave me. And I felt so blessed to have Liam. I didn't want another baby with Down syndrome, but not because I couldn't handle it and not because I didn't want it, but because I didn't want it for them. I didn't want them to have the trials that I know Liam's going to have to deal with in his lifetime. But it was coming from a different place. It was more about them and not for me. So I wouldn't have done anything regardless, so why find out? Courtney. Courtney. While learning about a diagnosis during pregnancy is helpful for some people, Others, like Sarah, would be comfortable finding out this information after their baby is born and choose not to have any testing during the pregnancy. Although prenatal screening may seem like a routine test, the decision to have the test is not something you should take lightly. When deciding if screening is right for you, ask yourself these questions. If I decide to have screening and the results are positive, would I consider having an amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling for a definite answer? How would I feel if I found out during my pregnancy that my baby has Down syndrome, a neural tube defect, or trisomy 18? Would I consider terminating the pregnancy? Would knowing my baby has one of these conditions help me and my providers better prepare for her or his birth? Would I want to have time before the birth to consider an adoption plan? How would I feel if I found out that my baby has Down syndrome, a neural tube defect, or trisomy 18 at the time of his or her birth? I would tell parents who are considering prenatal screening to just make sure that they really think about it and that they are doing it for the right reasons. I tell folks to tell, to tell themselves, what is it that I'm going to do in this situation? What, what, piece, what, what act am I going to do differently in this situation? Am I prepared to do the next step? So if, it, if, if the next step is something that you don't want to do, then, then don't start down the path. The only disadvantage of the prenatal screening that I can see is that in our case, we had a very high number that really made us nervous and stressed out more than probably what we needed to be. Be aware that there are false positives and that the test, you know, doesn't, isn't foolproof. It doesn't tell you everything. And sometimes, you know, even babies who are, you know, um, you know, born, born with disability don't come up in the screening. I mean, it isn't, you know, 100%. I mean, we know that. But it is, you know, it's what you're going to do with that information. The genetic counselor, the doctors, the nurses, everyone, um, gave us the pieces that we needed to make informed decisions that were right for us and supported us along the way. There's a lot to consider when deciding whether or not to have prenatal screening. Think it over and discuss it with your prenatal care provider. Together, you will make the decision that is right for you.